How many have heard David and Arthur speak before? Amen. Hey, Deb. Thank you. Okay. For those who haven't, you're in for a treat. Amen. And, um, you know, nowadays it seems that uh, everybody knows somebody that can relate to David's testimony. Amen. Um, just even a few years ago, you wouldn't be able to say that. But. So, David, if you're ready, you can come on up. Following David, um, we're going to have another break, and then we will finish off with the MPK band, and I encourage you all to stay for that. Um, and also, please check out the booze at, down the hallway, because those folks need our attention also. Um, I know everybody kind of congregates around the speakers areas, but we want to make sure that they're recognized also. So thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dave. So, first, I have a confession to make. I'm gay. But I was not gay when I was a homosexual. And I definitely wasn't gay when I was transgender. I'm gay now because the source of all joy and happiness, right, dwells within me. Because gay means happy. And so we're going to start taking back what the enemy has taken from us. Then we need to start with some of our words. And uh, I am gay. I say thank you, Jesus, for making me gay. Now... As some of you have seen, there was a little commotion, right? And listen, we cannot blame those young ladies for acting lost because guess what? They're lost. Amen. They are deceived. Preach it. And they are, and, and, and so we can't blame them for that. I don't blame them for that. My heart breaks for them. Yes. Yes. So when the truth was, was, was offered to them, the testimony, which is what we're called to do, right? Revelation yes. twelve eleven says that they overcame, meaning, meaning that if they overcame, meaning that they were once, they weren't overcomers, right? So they overcame him, meaning the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony. When we love our, when we love our life, Ugh. Do not love our life even when faced with death, right? So when the power of a testimony silenced them, then they wanted to move on to abortion. Mm -hmm. Well, then I took, brought, I pulled Lexi over there because they said that the four guys that were there couldn't talk to them about abortion because we were just old white men. So I said, okay, well, let me go get a young girl who can talk to you about abortion. And I brought Lexi over there and... And Lexi hammered it and nailed it and shut them down again. And then they were on to something else. And then we were blessed to see some of their own peers step up to the plate and say, Hey, look, you know what you came here for. You came here to disrupt a Christian event. You came here just for the purpose. And they did. Listen, they charged through that mall and walked right to my table and say, can you explain that poster? I said, yeah, absolutely. I gave them testimony. They said, well, that's not true. <laughs> oh. I said, well, wait a minute. Then they wanted to talk about what was morally right and morally wrong for me to do as a Christian. But then when it came to abortion, then they wanted to talk about the legal the legal aspect and it was no longer a moral aspect so what we see is that confusion is deception yes you would not know that you were being deceived if you knew you were being deceived it wouldn't be called deception right so now that i got that out of my system i'm glad i took i got notes because i'm going to try to stick to them I, um, 
I'm going to give you my testimony, but I, and, and I am going to give you a shortened version because there's some things I want to address within the church. Because my biggest opposition is the church. Amen. No, I'm not kidding. My biggest opposition is the church. I go to the pride parade and the LGBT embrace me. I have relationships with homosexuals and lesbians and transgenders. And you know what? You know what one of the lesbians told me not long ago? She said, David, I said, why, why do we still have a relationship? You know where I stand. She says, because you represent something to us. You represent hope. <clears throat> so that's what they're looking for. Hope. So my father took his life just before I was born. So naturally, as a young boy growing up, I was desiring same-sex intimacy. I desired intimacy with another male. Intimacy is not sex. I want to get that clear. Intimacy is a close, familial bond, and none of us know that because we go to the mall, we see intimate apparel, and you are not wearing any of that stuff to have a close, familiar bond with your brother or sister. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so I desired intimacy, male affirmation, male confirmation. It so happened that there were men in my life that took advantage of that. And they did what is called recruited me. What most of us here would call molested. So a family friend, a neighbor. And really it got to the point for me where I associated that negative sexual behavior with love. <clears throat> I associated being molested and being touched by dirty old men and dirty young men as love. And because I did, at eight years old, I would cut school and I would go hang out in the public bathroom or at public bus stops and wait for that dirty old man to come along. At the age of 13, I overdosed on pills at the age of 14, I was, I was full-fledged believing I was transgender. We didn't have that word transgender back then, by the way. We were either drag queens or trannies or transsexuals. And um, when I say tranny, I don't mean transmissions. I'm talking about transsexual. So that's, what we, that's the words we had. We didn't have transgender and cisgender and this gender and pangender and that gender. We didn't have all that nonsense because we knew there were only males and females. What we knew is that we were males <laughs> because we knew what, the, what our body told us when we stood in front of a mirror. And so what we tried to believe was we're a woman trapped in a man's body. <laughs> now there's a deception. And so because of this, and I, and I like to dress real feminine, I acted real feminine and started calling myself girl names. And my friends would call the house and say, hey, is... Is Dana home? And my mom be like, there ain't no Dana here. Click. So finally got to the point. My mom said, hey, listen, <clears throat> I had a son. I didn't have a daughter. You are not going to act like that under this roof. You're not going to behave like that. You're not going to dress like that. And you are not going to be going by these names, these made up names. I had a son. I gave birth to a boy and his name is David. You can't do that under this roof. I said, okay. So I left. And at 14 years old, I lived on the streets of Philadelphia. At 14 years old, I was prostituting my body because sex was all I knew. So my aspiration at 14 was to be the best prostitute I could possibly be. If I wasn't selling my body or giving it away, I was trading it for drugs. I was trading it for a place to sleep, trading it for alcohol. Maybe I was just trading it for attention. So I would go to nightclubs. I'd buy my drugs in the nightclub. And from the same man, I would buy my hormones. Black market hormones. 14 years old, I'm injecting myself with female hormones. I'm taking hormone pills. 14 years old, I was also HIV positive. And back then, when somebody was HIV positive, it was a death sentence. 
they had two medications called AZT and DDI, and both of them went into your system, and they, they did destroy the HIV virus, but they also okay. destroyed everything else inside of you. Okay. And so they crushed you and, and, and crippled you from the inside out. So I didn't take the medications. I went to my peers, the older trannies, the older drag queens. I said, hey, look, I am HIV positive. What am I supposed to do? They said, so what? So are we. The blankety blank that gave it to you didn't care. So don't you care who you give it to? And that was all you had to say to an angry, broken, confused, bitter, 14-year-old child living on the streets because how dare my mother want me to be the son that she gave birth to? How dare my mommy not accept my thoughts and feelings? I praise God. And my mom was not a Christian. She didn't even know Jesus. But she knew enough that she didn't want that darkness to envelop her baby. She knew enough that from the very nurturing nature of a mother to try to protect her baby from that darkness, a darkness that was okay for her friends because she had a lot of gay friends, homosexual friends, I need to say, right? Take back the words like it's not a lifestyle because if anybody in this room can tell me one sin that leads to life, I'll call it a lifestyle. But until then, it's a death style. That's right. So as I took hormones and not only lived a lie, but became a lie and pretended to be what I was and I found some form of happiness. You know, a lot of us, we know some people with a form of godliness. Well, I found a form of happiness in being who I was not I was all in. I was in and out of juvenile detention. I was in and out of the county jail as an adult. And I was in and out of prison, state prison. And my second time in prison, I looked like that. Matter of fact, that second photo is actually my booking card when they first brought me into the county jail before I went to prison. So here I am, as if being a man that looks like a woman in a man's prison isn't spectacle enough for you. I'm cheerleading on the rec yard for the guys playing basketball. There's a correctional officer and he's looking at me and he says, hey, you come here. And I bounce up to him, I'm like, what? He said, what's your name? I said, Paige. He said, no, that's a girl's name. What's the name your mama gave you? I said, David. He said, well, David, do you know that God didn't create you to be this way? That's right. Ooh, listen, I'm sitting there in my mind. I'm thinking this man drinking haterade. He, he has just offended me. He has hurt my feelings. He's really ticked me off. I'll have his job. So arrogantly, I said, of course he did. Look at me. I do this well. He said, no, he didn't even intend for you to look like that. He said, I'm going to tell you this every day because I can. And he did. And it got to the point where I'd see him and I'd say, I know God didn't create me to be this way. And then I'd be walking away like, what did you just say? Well, let me tell you what. That man, we called him Bishop because he witnessed an inmate and correctional officer the same. Treated everybody the same. Treated nobody different. Nobody was special because they were because they wore a badge. And nobody was lesser of a human being because they wore a number. And that was important to me. This was the first man in my entire life, we're talking 30 something years here, that had ever stood before me that I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that this man truly loved me that he cared about me and that he wanted nothing but the best for me. This man wanted to pour into me what had ever so freely, right? What had been poured into him ever so freely. That was his focus. That was his goal. 
His goal was to touch a life. And he touched my life. Now, I didn't get out of prison and become a man of God. I, I, like any other dog, I returned to my vomit. And uh, I added a few things. I started selling dope and doing dope and, and uh, gambling a lot. And uh, <laughs> I just remember as, the, as a few years passed on, I started having a lot of pain in my core, in my body. And I started getting like kind of hunched over. And I started going to the doctor like twice a week. I was in excruciating pain. I was getting more and more hunched over. I couldn't stand up straight. I needed a cane for a very short period of time because then I needed a walker. And I was completely bent over and dragging myself around on a walker. And as it turns out, I had a very progressive disease, osteoporosis. It's known as an elderly woman's disease. Wow. Do you mean all the hormones? Same ones that we're feeding children today. You mean they cause disease? <laughs> they cause a lot more than that. They also cause depression, of which I had chronic major depression, anxiety, sleeping disorders. I was on a slew of psyche medications as well. But you know what? Being in excruciating pain, dragging myself around on a walker, still didn't stop me from wanting to satisfy the lusts of my flesh. It still didn't stop me from wanting to go to the casino and to the club and to the corner. It still didn't want to stop me from engaging in that activity. And so in 2009, the Lord struck me down and <laughs> with full-blown AIDS. And the reason I say that, let me, let me clarify that, because I know there's some people right now that go, <laughs> I knew it. AIDS is God's punishment. No, it's not. AIDS was my reward. AIDS was my recompense for the choices I made in life. You know, we all think rewards are good things and wonderful things, right? Not always. My reward or my recompense for my choices was AIDS, was osteoporosis, was looking like a woman and being a man. Those were my rewards. So when I was stricken down with full-blown AIDS, the doctor said, David, your immune system is gone. Anyone in the medical field that knows what T-cells are, it's how they measure your, your immune system. My T-cells went from 12,000 to 11 to zero in weeks. My viral load went up to hundreds by the hundreds of thousands per part which means the virus take, took over my body. The doctor says, look, you don't even have to take the HIV medicine anymore. You won't survive. And they sent me home and they put a hospital bed in my home. And they put a hospice in place. And they had even when I, I remember sitting, laying up in the bed and somebody, a little team came out to give me all this neat little plastic furniture so I could die in peace. Now, when I was in prison, my mama, who wasn't a Christian at the time, at the time, sent me a Bible. You send your kid a Bible when they're in prison, right? They can't read one in school, <laughs> but they can have one when they're in prison. Amen. Maybe if I would have had one in school, <laughs> I wouldn't have ended up in prison, right? Amen. So I, when I got this Bible, when I was in prison, I, w I went to the Bible guy, right, on the compound. I'm like, hey, what do I do with this? He said, oh, read Psalms and Proverbs. Oh, they're inspirational. Psalms is very inspirational. I said, okay. And I went back to my dorm and I laid in my bunk and I opened it up and I found Psalms. And, and I started reading. I'm like, crush them. Bring them to their knees. Murder them. Kill them. I signed a shout. That's not very inspirational. <laughs> I was reading the imprecatory Psalms, most likely, right? So I threw that Bible in my footlocker and never touched it again. But I did bring it home with me and I put it on my nightstand because your nightstand looks a little cuter with a Bible on it, right? Well, I used that Bible as a coaster. And I'll tell you what, <clears throat> when I was laying in that hospital bed and knew that my life was over, I accepted that my life was over I was afraid to die 
And then I realized I was afraid to die because I didn't want to go to hell. Because I knew I was going to hell. It was almost like a download. <laughs> like I knew I was going to hell. I knew hell was what I deserved. I also knew that God wasn't sending me to hell, but he was honoring my choice to go. So I accepted that my life was over. That's okay. <coughs> but I picked up that Bible that sat on my nightstand. And I opened it up. And the very first verse I ever read in the New Testament was Romans 127. And it said, men burning in lust for one another, giving up the natural function of the woman. And I slammed it shut again. And I was like, really? Because that one passage just spoke to my entire life. And it just crushed my entire foundation that I ever thought I stood on. So as I laid on that, that bed, I dove into the Word. And I just started absorbing all that I could. And, and the Word was so detailed, so precise, that, you know, look, you got to repent. You got to talk to me. You got to release this stuff. You got to speak this stuff. And I'm like, okay. And here I am speaking it. Because there's power in the tongue, right? There's power in words. Words have power. So as I spoke these things to a God that I knew, he knew everything that I was speaking to him. I knew he knew everything that I had done. But I was, as I was speaking to them, I was releasing the power that those things held over me. And as I did that, I felt freer and freer and freer. I was still in excruciating pain. I still accepted that I was going to die. I never once asked them to heal me. I didn't even think that was an option. And I woke up one morning and I was really confused as if that's not being really confused. But I was really confused because I was in excruciating pain. And I had joy in my heart. I was physically miserable. But emotionally and spiritually satisfied. I felt complete. I said, okay, God, I'm ready. You can take me any minute now. I am ready. Take me. I said, but I have one request that through my death, somebody will come to know you. That through my death, you could be glorified. Selfishly, I was thinking of my mama getting saved. And hallelujah that I was. Because she is. <laughs> so, <laughs> amen. So, I started improving from that moment, okay? And as you can see, I don't have to go through the details, okay? My doctors say I'm undetectable. The anonymous HIV tests that I've had done say that I'm negative, okay? The chronic depression, the bipolar, the uh, anxiety, the major chronic depression, I should have said, and the sleeping disorders, I recognize them immediately as not diseases. I immediately said, these are not diseases. I will not take that anymore because these are symptoms. These are results of being of the world. I was no longer of this world. I was just in it. And I completely understood this. It's okay. I'm done. And I was done with medications. And I did nothing but improve. And so... So, so the big moment was my moment of grace, right? Which I should have trained, you know, did the next slide, but I didn't. So, but God, two of my favorite words in the scriptures, but God, but Yahweh, right? So these are the arguments that I get. See, I'm not, I'm not, I am not. don't want to, I got, I got a limited time and I'm going to jump all over the place right now because these are the arguments I get. And these are the arguments that, that the church for a few hundred years has been arguing with people. I don't argue with people. They say, I was born this way. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> you were born that way. I was born that way too. We're all born that way, whatever that is for each of us, because we're all born into sin. But I was born that way. Jesus said, be born again. And I was. And it was that simple. Well, this is just who I am. You're right. That was who I was too. But when I read the scriptures, Jesus said, deny yourself. So I did. It's that simple. 
This is the one that really gets everybody. Well, Jesus loves me. You're right. He does. But it's not his love that we need to obtain. It's not his love that gets us into the kingdom. We need to obtain his mercy. I can't theologically explain something, spiritually explain something to natural people. Because those same scriptures say that you cannot feed the natural man spiritually because he will not receive it. So I have to not argue with them. And I think that's what everybody has to do is not argue. I've been able to establish relationships with men and women that are trapped in that movement and a part of that movement. And I've watched, I've been, and I've been blessed to see some of them come out of that movement. I've been blessed to see them forsake their wicked ways. I've been blessed to see them say, David, I don't want to be a homosexual. I've been blessed to have them tell me, David, you filled a void. You filled a void in me. All of my life, I've been trying to fill this void. And I thought I could fill it with sex, but I couldn't. It was intimacy. Because that's, that's where we've lost it. That's where we've dropped the ball. Yep. And I'm, and I'm going to tell you before I get off the stage why, how I know that the church <clears throat> has dropped the ball yes. right. when it comes to intimacy. First, this is Brooklyn. Brooklyn molested, confused, became transgender, stumbled upon a, a video testimony online. That told her that she didn't have to be that way. Happened to be my testimony. Michael. Michael was a transgender prostitute with HIV, AIDS, on drugs, on alcohol, on the East Coast. Or, or I mean the West Coast, the left coast. That's the West Coast. So on the left coast. And Michael sat in his living room one afternoon and he said, God, if, if, if you didn't make me this way, give me a sign. I knew I was supposed to be this way, and Michael went about his business. But then that night, Michael was on a pornography website, searching for pornography. And up in front of him po uh, pops up a YouTube video of some man saying, I used to be transgender, and now I'm not. <laughs> Michael says, <"Ooh." laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> And now he's not. It is that simple. I have a testimonial booklet on my table. Just available for a donation. It's the gospel. And it could be, it's not me, I'm not special. Because it could be anybody in this room. Put their face on a booklet and give their testimony. And that's the gospel. Amen. That is what we're supposed to be doing, yes. is, is giving our testimony, sharing our testimony. And now I want to share, before I get off of this stage, I want to share something with you. There's two men. I do a, I do a live podcast too, Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. most of the time. Um, and this right here was, I, I wanted to share this because if you just read the first four chapters of the Bible, <clears throat> it pretty much uh, lets you know that evolution is a lie, right? Let you know that there are only two genders. Let you know that marriage is between one man and one woman, because only one man and one woman can become one flesh. Let you know that feminism is a lie, and it also lets you know that all religious roads do not lead to Yahweh, God the Father. So, I want to tell you about Nick and Jay. I met Nick at a rest stop. He was searching for random, anonymous sex. HIV positive, molested as a child several times. I got to speak with him for a couple hours, actually. and Then I didn't hear from him. He, he called me six months later. <laughs> I've hit rock bottom. Can we talk? 
So I went from Maine to Pennsylvania and spent a couple days with him. He needed intimacy. He knew that's what he needed. So he started going to a good church. At least I thought it was. Truth. Oh yeah, they know homosexuality is a sin, so they must be all right. They know that abortion is murder, so they must be okay. We can go to that congregation. We can go up in that building. Well, Nick was asked by his pastor last month if he would ease up for a while going to men's group. Because the men weren't comfortable with him laying his head on their shoulder. The men weren't comfortable with him hugging them so much. Especially after what you've come out of, Nick. You understand, don't you? He understood perfectly. <laughs> and he left that building and he never went back. But what he did do is dive back into the LGBT movement. Oh. Nick is kind of safe right now, okay? He's out of a dark place and he's trying to understand. I just drove to three different states to make sure of that. Jay, I met Jay 2018 at the Columbus Pride Parade. Jay came out of the movement five months after five, six months of our relationship, establishing a relationship, showing him intimacy, having no problem wrapping my arms around him, embracing him, not just hugging him, but embracing him. Letting him cry himself to sleep in my arms while I rocked him. <laughs> intimacy. Last month, Jay tried to take his life. Because he says, none of the men in my church want anything to do with me, David. They don't even want to treat me like their brother. Intimacy. It's lacking. I got a question. How many men in this room right now, if your baby brother came to you sobbing, how many of you would wrap your arms around him and embrace him? Mm. How many of you would wrap, wrap your arms around and embrace the man sitting to your right, left, or behind you or in front of you if he came to you sobbing and lay his head on your chest and rock him to sleep? See, that's a different, that's a different story. I can show my son or my brother this blood right here. This makes us relatives. The blood of Jesus makes us family. And it should all put us all into an intimate relationship, one with another, as well as our father. And Jesus being the head, it will remain separated from this body until the body can come together. Because the body is just, just imagine a ball created by a thousand different balls. And all those balls are starting to spread apart. That's the church. That's the body of Jesus the Christ, of Yeshua. Separated. Because we don't want to offend somebody. We don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Well, I can't have that come into my congregation. You know how many pastors have said, David, this is amazing. Oh, the whole world needs to hear about it, but not my congregation. You know how many pastors said, I'm going to have you in my church. You're going to be there in a week or two. And then they call me up and say, sorry, but the board said no. They don't want to touch that. They don't want to offend nobody. They don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So my only question is, when are the men going to stand up and be men? And yeah, it does mean being a, a warrior and being a good soldier and being able to stand firm on your ground and to be ready for anything that comes your way. But holding fast is not just a military term. It does not mean just locking arms and locking your shields together and holding fast. Holding fast for the body of Jesus the Christ means that all the men need to come together and be men and need to be intimate. And if you're not intimately intertwined, then there's a problem. And when I'm the one that has to say, Nick, I don't know. I can't, what, what am I supposed to say about this, Nick? I can't give you no answer to why your pastor said, don't come to men's group anymore because the men aren't good with you hugging on them. 
All I can say is, now you need to find some real men of God. Because I have men of God in my life, and I'm going to tell you right now, there is, there's not one of the men of God in my life, in my family, that I can't wrap my arms around and weep on his shoulder, on his chest. There's not one of them that can't wrap his arms around me and put his head on my chest and weep, if, if that's what he needs. Because it's about being representing Jesus to Christ, word, deed, action. And so each of us have to be that representation. Word, deed, action. And that's all I got. That's all I got. Thank you.